Ahoy up there! I don't see anything. I think man has been intrigued with the stars and the heavens probably since the beginning of time. And thousands of years later, that curiosity hasn't changed at all. Hi, I'm Shannon Perry, and I'm with the Huron Valley chapter of the AIA in Michigan, and I'm here to tell you about this fantastic building behind me. Known for its significance in science, education, astronomy, architecture, the Greek Revival Detroit Observatory is the oldest observatory in the country with its original telescope still in their working order. And it's the second oldest building on the University of Michigan campus and the oldest one in its unaltered form. We're here on what's called the hill part of the central campus on the university and at one point this was the highest point on campus and I think you'll see why this great gem was built. Let's take a look at some of the details. The building is constructed of solid brick with an exterior stucco coating scored to look like individual blocks of stone. A solid brick pier extends from 15 feet below grade up into the central dome. The Fitz refracting telescope is mounted atop the brick pier on a smaller limestone pier. The brick is constructed around but does not touch the central pier in order to minimize vibration that would distort the telescopic image. It's pretty forthright thinking on the part of the architects and the astronomers who developed this because that was probably before we have all these semi-trucks and buses going by like we do now. The building is a simple Greek Revival style but has Italianate details such as the carved brackets supporting the wide eaves. The comprehensive restoration work which was done in 1998 included reconstruction of the porch balustrade, replication of historic shutters, and the sensitive addition of a barrier-free entrance on the east side. The restoration work was done by a nationally renowned architectural firm, which is our very own Ann Arbor-based Quinn Evans Architects, and they also have an office in Washington, D.C. Let's go take a look inside. We're inside the observatory right now in a room that was once used as the director's office and actually it was two rooms. And now it's a very nice library and research area and a bit of a small museum. The Detroit Observatory was the vision of the first president of the University of Michigan, Henry Tappan. And in his inaugural address, he expressed this vision and there were some distinguished Detroit businessmen in the audience and they began a fundraising campaign and they funded the building. Originally it was going to be on the main campus but eventually this site was discovered and settled on and this is a hill about half a mile from the campus just outside the city limits. If we take a look at this photo over here we'll see the first photo ever taken of the Detroit Observatory shortly after its construction, completed in 1854. The observatory went through several changes. Wings were added, wings were taken off. If you take a look at these, this photo here and the one next to it, these photos show an east wing that was added in 1868 to house the university observatory director at that time. It was a residence for the director. I just want to talk for a second about the architecture of the building again. The central square is 33 feet square and there's an east wing and a west wing, each 19 feet by 29 feet. We're in the west wing right now. When we go to the east wing, that's for the Meridian Circle Telescope. And I just want you to take a look at this celestial globe here. This for those of you who haven't had astronomy in a couple years, this right here is the meridian circle, the north-south line, and that room has shutters that open up so you can view everything in the north-south line. But keep in mind, this is a very thin sliver when you're considering the entire cosmos and, and also the volume of the Earth. And um, We'll talk about that a little bit more when we go in there, but as we move through this building, for all of you architects out there, keep in mind the old adage, form follows function, because I think this building truly expresses that. 
the dome and the telescope that it houses, which is the main part of the building, is really the focus of everything. And that's expressed from the very top all the way down to the depths of the basement, which we're going to take you to see. So let's go check it out. Here we are in the central square of the building on the main floor. And you can see this building is completely dominated, this central part, by this giant pier that you're looking at. And this is what houses the refractor telescope, which is in the dome. It's a really neat part of the structure, I think. And what we mentioned before is how it's separated from the rest of the building. And you can see by looking on the floor, there's actually a gap of at least one inch all the way around. None of the building structure comes into contact with this pier. And this central room here makes a great exhibit space for various surveying instruments, photography and astrophysics expeditions, optics, and things like that. So it's a fun little museum totally surrounded by this pier. Well, before we go up to see the cool telescope, we're going to go down to see the foundation of this building. And I'm actually standing on the stairs leading down to the basement right now, which are located under this trap door in the one and only restroom in the building. And I love this sign here. It says, restroom above, please knock before entering. So if you're in the basement, you can't just pop up in on somebody while they're in the restroom. Be careful as we go down here. It's very steep. It's a good thing I'm a sailor and I'm used to these ship ladders. See you when we get down there. We're now in the basement of the central part of the observatory and you can see that the stone walls are very similar to some of the local churches and uh, the Cavern Club here in Ann Arbor and some great old stonework of those days in, in the middle 1800s. The solid brick walls that you're seeing around the outskirts support the dome that's above and again we'll land on the main central pier which houses the telescope and you can see now that it truly is solid brick. When we were upstairs, you could see that it was covered with stucco made to look like limestone. And I'm down here. <laughs> I'm standing down in the lowest part of the basement that we can actually get to. It's kind of like a crypt down here. In the 1970s, this building was vacant for many years. And in the 70s, some students were using it for their office and teaching space. And uh, they actually had different offices set up around here. And if you can look to your left and my right, you can see that they cannibalized doors and things like that from other parts of campus to uh, doors and windows to use to help divide up the space. There's also a wall here that's got a lot of graffiti on it, which they decided to leave during the restoration just to kind of remember that era. There's one more spot in the basement we have to go to, so let's move over. Now we're in the basement of the east wing, which is the Meridian Circle Wing. And this room, which you'll soon see, has several components that need to have solid foundations. So if you look over here, first you're going to see the one that is supporting one of the telescopes that is used strictly to calibrate the Meridian Circle Telescope. And again, all of these are solid brick masonry. The big one here in the center is for the main telescope in that room. And then there's another one, another couple actually, behind us that are used to um, also house the clock and the other telescope. And we'll learn about all those instruments in just a minute. Now we're in the east wing, which is the Meridian Circle Telescope Room. And I would like to introduce you to Karen White, Project Coordinator for the Detroit Observatory with the, Det with the Bentley Historical Library. Thanks for having us, Karen. Hey, thanks for coming. And Karen is going to show us how the shutters operate and tell us a little bit about the instrumentation that's in here. If you remember before when we were looking at the globe and talking about the meridian circle. This is the room we're in and it's that very little sliver that we're going to be looking through with this telescope. Well apparently it would take all day for the instruments to be calibrated and set just right so that they want, when they wanted to look at it at nighttime it would be all in the right settings. Karen, how do they go about this? Instead of all day, can you tell us in 30 seconds? <laughs> 
exactly how they did that, and, and modern astronomers don't know that much about how they did it. The, just the expertise to make this equipment work has pretty much died out. But it would take the better part of a day just to calibrate the instrument to determine how much error was in the telescope. Because after they made their observations, they would be factoring in the errors built into the telescope to compensate for their observational errors. So um, they would do things like make sure that the instrument was totally plumb in one direction. And they have counterweights here and on the other side to subtly adjust the instrument, they would take a sighting of a star through the, the um, lens up top, and they would bounce that sighting off of um, a pan that was filled with mercury, a basin filled with mercury, which would sit down here. And they used mercury in this pan because mercury would absolutely become level. It was finer than any mirror could be ground by taking a sighting through the lens, through the eyepiece, and bouncing it off the mercury, they could then make determinations about how much uh, the instrument needed to be adjusted. And they would do all of this in the vertical dimension. They would also do it in the horizontal dimension. There are telescopes to either side, small telescopes, called collimating telescopes. And they would remove this from the central block of the telescope, and I won't take it all the way off, but they would remove this so that they could take sightings through the side telescopes from one telescope to the other through this instrument to make sure it was plumb in that direction. So they're doing this, they're doing that, they're also doing it, and I don't want to bump you, they would also do some of those observations at an angle. After they had done all of that for either the northern or the southern hemisphere, right now it's pointing to the southern hemisphere, then they would use this equipment, which is a, a trolley. It runs on, its, runs on its own railroad tracks. They would get that underneath the telescope and then crank this up to remove the telescope axle from its mounting. Then they would pull it back out of the way, turn the telescope 180 degrees, put it back on its axle, lower it down, and then do all those calibrations again in the other direction. I don't think I would want to be responsible for moving this <laughs> telescope. I should have no, but it's, really, it's a wonder that such a really finely engineered piece of equipment was shipped across the Atlantic from Berlin to the United States, dropped in New York City, schlepped from New York City out to the Michigan frontier, put in place, and it still worked. I mean, it's, it's really a tribute to the engineering that went into this instrument and the care that was taken. That's amazing. Do you mind if I take a look through it? No. This telescope was used to determine accurate longitude, which is closely dependent on knowing what the accurate time is. And we take it for granted now, but during those times, it was nothing to take for granted. And this, this facility and this telescope helped a lot of people and a lot of uh, astronomers and also weather stations. This was set up as a weather station for a while, and it really helped a lot of scientists and researchers around the country at that time. So if you're ready, let's go up to the main dome. Well, we've just climbed one set of stairs, and we only have one more small flight of stairs to climb to get up to the dome. This is the outside wall of the dome, the brick, solid brick uh, structure that we saw down in the basement. And it's kind of like a crow's nest up here, which I think is really interesting. And again, we're in a building that's 152 years old. Can't wait for you to see the next part. Well, you remember the large pier that we looked at in the basement and on the main floor and the outside of the dome as we came up here. Here is the very top of that pier. And then it goes to a limestone pier from there up the last few feet here to actually house the telescope.
Now we're up in the dome space, the place for the main telescope in the building. And the dome roof itself is constructed with small, thin pieces of wood that are overlaid and creating a beehive sort of a shape. And the original system for moving the dome was updated in the latter part of the 19th century to what we have now, which is a railroad style track. And the entire dome roof can rotate. I'm going to see if I can show you how. It's actually fairly simple. Right now, the observatory is surrounded by other buildings, including a dormitory building, Alice Lloyd, which is where I lived when I was a freshman here at the University of Michigan. That probably was my window that I'm looking at right now, because one day in the middle of the day, I was sitting at my desk doing homework, and I used to look out on this building, of course, and I glanced up, and the roof of the dome was turning. The shutter was open, and the telescope came out and pointed right into my face. Our system is a simple pulley and cable system, and the shutters open like flaps. Unfortunately, we're not able to open them for you today, but Karen, this telescope is amazing. Isn't it wonderful? What can you tell us about it? Well, at the time that this telescope was put in, it was the third largest in the world. So suddenly Michigan went from being nowhere on the astronomical map, so to speak, to being one of the leading research centers for astronomy in the United States and in the world, third largest in the world. It was um, put in place in 1857. It's an American telescope, unlike the one downstairs, which was made in Berlin. This one was made in New York City by a telescope maker named Henry Fitz, who was actually self-taught. He was interested in uh, photography, had become um, trained in doing daguerreotypes, and then branched out from there into making lenses and finally telescopes. And so he um, contracted to make this telescope. It cost $6,000 in the 1850s. And the whole budget for this building was something like $26,000, $27,000 total. So a huge portion of the budget for the entire facility was tied up in this instrument. He unfortunately had a highly secret um, protected uh, knowledge about how he was making his lenses mm -hmm. and um, died unexpectedly early and took his secrets with him. And so precisely how he ground his lenses to such exacting standards is not known today. But we do have one of the very few telescopes that's um, got its original lenses that have been untouched. Um, la often later um, astronomers would re-grind the lenses, trying to tweak it, sort of like when you're working on your hot rod, you try to make it run a little better. Well, astronomers would often monkey with the lenses to make them better, mm -hmm. but these lenses, so far as we can tell, have never really been touched. They've been cleaned, but they've never been re-ground. And isn't it true that he had to make this two or three times for it to yeah, be acceptable? Yeah, that's, that's part of the problem with uh, working with an American telescope maker rather than a European one at the time. But um, they made the decision, either for cost reasons or for political reasons, to go with an American telescope maker. And, and Fitz was one of the best available at the time. So um, when he made his first telescope, they shipped it out here from New York City, got it up. Uh, and the um, director of the observatory, Franz Brunoff, took a look at it and he said, this is not good enough. You're going to have to get this out of here and try again. And so they sent a loner. And for a while, there was a loner in place up here. And finally, this telescope arrived in 1857. And Brunoff was finally satisfied with the quality of the instrument. And what is this structure behind you here? Ah, This is probably the second observer's chair that was ever used in this building. Actually, maybe the third, if you count. Um, early on, there was, uh, you can see a scar in the dome wall there. They actually had a perch attached to the dome so that when you rotated the dome, the astronomer sitting on this little seat would rotate with the dome. Uh, that wasn't either very safe or very convenient, and so they replaced it with one of these moving ladder type assemblies where you could go as high or as low as you needed to go based on the, the angle of the telescope. And then there were also, this is the seat, there were counterweights 
and we've got some of them stored down here, but the same sort of systems that were used to balance the telescopes were used to balance the astronomer so that he could either lift up or down to be at the correct height to see through the eyepiece. And because you wouldn't necessarily be looking in that direction, you might be looking in that direction or that direction, you had to be able to move the seat. And so this whole assembly could be moved around the dome now, you obviously want to plug the hole up there where we came in, but once you were in here and you sealed the hole, you could move this all the way around the dome to follow the tracking of the telescope. That's fascinating. Well, here we are underneath the portrait of Henry Tappan, the first president of the university that I mentioned, the man who had the vision to start this building in the beginning. And Karen, can you tell me, how do people find out more about it? Well, we do list the open house dates and times on our website. We're part of the Bentley Historical Library, so if you go to the Bentley website, which is bentley.umich.edu, and then click on the Detroit Observatory link on that page, that will pull up uh, schedule and information and parking information and give you phone numbers to call in case you need to ask further questions. So the building is open for tours and selected Generally dates? Generally twice each month, and that differs a little bit. We try not to do it on a football Saturday so that you're not competing with that kind of traffic, but generally every two weeks through the academic year. Great. Well, I would highly recommend coming down here or up to the hill as it would be for a tour of this building. It's an awesome building. It's not just awesome, it's astronomical. <laughs>